in this room, okay, we are going through a topic of institutionalizing volunteer management practices in your respective organizations. Yeah, so maybe I, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Jun Jie. Yeah, I'm the Community Engagement Manager uh, at uh, HCSA, and I'm honored to be your moderator for today. Uh, alongside with me, uh, thank you so much. Alongside me is Keeling. Yeah, she's the. Uh, sorry, <laughs> you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> okay, I'm a volunteer manager at SPD. Sorry, a bit under the weather today, so he's the boss today. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Keeling. So both of us will be your moderators for today. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, today we have uh, three speakers, and I will be introducing them shortly to you. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we have uh, Melissa Wong. Yeah, so uh, Melissa, please uh, wave. Yeah. Uh, so Melissa is our executive director for Babes uh, Pregnancy Crisis uh, Support Limited, and then we next up, uh, I think everyone is familiar, uh, Mr. Sung Hock Ling, uh, he's the uh, chief of Civil Generation Office uh, of Agency of Integrated Care AIC, and last but not least, we have Miss uh, Tumina Sapawi, okay, who is the CEO for PPIS. Okay, Singapore uh, Muslim uh, Women's Association. Yeah, so without further ado, can I invite our speakers up to take your seats at the front? Yeah. Uh, maybe you sit in arrangement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, easier. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So to kick off today's uh, session, okay, uh, what will happen is this. So uh, we will have a quick, uh, the three speakers have kindly uh, prepared some presentation slides to share with you all what, does, uh, what do, do their organization do. And then subsequently, once that is done, we will have some uh, conversations. And uh, the last segment will be a QA. and a uh, And that should wrap up our one hour time here. Lah. Yeah. Without further ado, uh, can I have the slides for Melissa? Stand like a bit like informal because it's quite cozy. Okay, so I'm uh, Melissa from Bates Pregnancy Crisis Support. So, not sure how many of you actually heard of Bates. Okay, so we've been around for 17 years. So, what we do is uh, we support pregnant teens who are 21 years and below. So, we've been around since 2005, and when we first started, it was to tackle the issue of uh, abandonment of babies by teens. However, over the years, um, this issue has kind of declined and all. And now, even if you're looking at birth rate, right, in Singapore, it's declining. So for teens, it is also declining. So uh, last year, it was about 200 plus, 222. It's still low. But any pregnancy by teen is still an area of concern. So our vision in, in the last refresh and the last 10 years, uh, what we have refreshed last year is really to look at uh, raising awareness so that they can, um, the teens can prevent unplanned pregnancies. Okay, and how we go about doing it is to provide them with resources and uh, practical support and journey with them through the pregnancy journey regardless of the outcome. And that's where we will provide them the information. Okay, so we don't decide on the outcome, but the teens will be the ones who decide. So this is our team. We are a nine-person team. So I've been with BAPES for two years. So in the last uh, two years, we've expanded from seven to nine. So as you can see, mainly female. We have one, one guy. Okay, yeah, so uh, this is only possible with, um, because of COVID, there's opportunity to actually re-innovate um, and redesign. So that's where we have the reshuffling and we have been able to expand the team. So this is our services. Mainly we have case management. Uh, that's where we will work with the teens for about a year to year and a half. And we run a 24-hour helpline. So this is solely managed by our volunteers in the last two years. Prior to this, this was solely managed by staff. So imagine we have seven staff and we have to kind of rotate uh, to manage this helpline. And also we have youth and outreach engagement where we reach out to schools, do roadshows, do talks. And lastly, we work through partnerships where we have um, befriended services, uh, practical assistance. So things like donation and kinds that come in, how do we go about even distributing them, sorting them? It's also through partners and volunteers. And lastly, we also work with partners and volunteers to organize workshops and events. So briefly, in a nutshell, this is the services that we do. Okay, so how does this um, come in into our topic for today? So how do we institutionalize volunteer uh, management in, at, at BAPES? It's very much through resources. As you can see, we are a very, very small team. And for our operating budget in a year, it's actually under a million. So we are considered a small agency. However, we do have IPC status. So with IPC status, there comes in a lot of governance and, and stuff that we need to note. This, so this is not possible if we don't have NCSS support. 
And of course, how do we know where we are? We managed to use the volunteer management matrix. So I think this is something, a tool that most of you are familiar with. And in the last two years, they have kind of changed a bit of uh, the measurement. So when we first started off, we only have half a headcount who was doing uh, VM. However, in the last two years, we managed to uh, hire a full headcount. And this was also possible because it was during COVID where they had uh, the SG United program. So we had the opportunity to introduce an intern who was studying uh, volunteer management and program. And what happened was that with that, I took the opportunity to, okay, why not we try the internship? And from the internship, we try a contract role. So I kind of got the buy-in from the team and the board to see that how this could work out because the team being very, very small and with a small operating budget, it is very difficult to get a full head count. So with funding, opportunity, we kind of slowly worked my way up in the last two years. So I hired, uh, the, we started the internship for about four months and then with a contract for one year and eventually they saw the success because we managed to uh, have volunteers who was manning the helpline. So this kind of took about one and a half year before we reached to where we are today. And at the end of the one and a half year journey, uh, we also went on digitalization because with COVID, you cannot do it in person. And our helpline was so traditional. Mobile phone passed to every, every staff every two weeks. With COVID, you're supposed to not even stay at home, right? The restriction. So how our helpline cannot uh, not, not work. So we tap on tech and go for digitalization and we managed to have a telephony system, which is app-based. So with app base, anytime, anywhere, um, all calls, all texts will and can be received. Yeah, so this is how we kind of uh, worked in the last two years in terms of tapping on available resources, big tools, funding, uh, or even management, uh, like the volunteer engagement tool to see where we are. And because of COVID, we kind of have to re-engage our volunteers. So that, that tool kind of gave us uh, a baseline on where we are in the first year. And in the second year, we, we saw an increase because that level of engagement has changed. Okay, next is the last slide. So this is very much to show the life cycle of employee and volunteers. Why I show the same slide is because at BAPES, we kind of take this the same way. How we treat our employees and volunteers is through the same cycle. We go through uh, the attracting, recruitment, the onboarding, and then we develop them by having relevant training. So for example, the helpliners, we do provide them with training. So we work very closely with SOS on their care techs training. So we also communicate and, and uh, share good practices with different agencies who actually have helpline services. So we also learn from each other on how best we could improve. So this is just an example of training and development. And then recently with the job role redesign that NCSS has, we are able to carve out JDs for our volunteers. So by ident identifying what are the roles that each individual uh, volunteer can contribute, they can also take ownership in how they want to um, take on certain responsibilities. So just now I think like when um, I think the speaker and Ah uh, Singh they were say talking about ownership. So this has to come from the individual. And then of course retention, how do we retain them as with staff? There's things like regular engagement, long service. So recognizing their contributions. And this can come in small ways. So even things like if we do need to give them like reimbursement for having to travel or even sometimes makan, right, where you have training, these are little things that can encourage individuals. So it's really no different by having a budget that we carve out for staff to be the same uh, as volunteers. And then lastly, there will always be separation or termination because I think for even for staff, these days the turnaround could be maybe two, three years. Unlike in the past where you have long service, right, people stay more than five or ten. Yeah, so how do we also uh, terminate or end the relationship uh, amicably? Because we do understand that for volunteers, there could be a different stage, different phase. So there, we have to kind of uh, be prepared that they will not be staying with us to, uh, for long. So how do we ensure that there is this continuity? And even should they leave us, they may come back again. Yeah, who knows as with uh, staff, right? Yeah. So what is important at the whole of this cycle is really communication because we also need to get staff buy-in. As much as we have volunteers coming in, Staff also need to know how we can engage the volunteers to, to do our work. So that's why uh, at BAPES, uh, there is open communication. We have uh, shared with staff that should you need anything and you think that you cannot cope and all, let's, let's share and talk about it. What is it that volunteers, what is it that only you can do? And if there are bits of work that, vol that can be outsourced to volunteers, what does this look like? And how can we have that continuous, um, how do we scope out that work such that we can have someone coming in to do it regularly and even if we can't do it regularly, could it be bite-sized? So at this point in time, we have volunteers that comes in from, from different um, 
different walks of life. So we work with schools, like for example, SMU, they, students need to clock 40, 80 hours before they can graduate. So some of them come in ad hoc for project based. So on our end, it's really like a win-win. How do we scope that out for individuals to be able to contribute at their own time and own pace? Yeah, that's all I have for my presentation. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Hock Lin from AIC yeah, to share uh, about what AIC does. Hock Lin, please. Uh, I'll share a little bit. Uh, first, can I show a hand how many of you are from the private sector? So none. Uh, people sector, that means non-profit. Huh? Okay. <laughs> then the public one? Huh? Public sector? Oh, okay. Can. Uh, no sector. <laughs> Freelance one, don't have. Huh? Okay. So a lot of you are from, so I, I just, uh, I'm Hock Lin, I'm the Chief uh, Silver Generation Office, and uh, previously I'm uh, Chief Active IG, uh, because only three months, so every time I keep saying, <laughs> I have to be slow down myself. All right, so I, I want to share about this uh, idea about refraining volunteerism. Uh, so I'll share a little bit about myself, then uh, my organization, then some of the uh, big ideas that we are doing. Uh, so a uh, new kid on the block, so uh, you know, we start with new ideas, and I want to acknowledge my colleagues here, Vino from public uh, policy comms, and uh, Lin is also from volunteer management. And the reason they are here is to answer all the difficult questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, so a little bit of myself. La. In order to talk about volunteer management, first, uh, we must be volunteer. La. Then you work through the journey, all right? So uh, first, uh, in my job, uh, before I took on the job, I'm a, a silver generation ambassador. And uh, really understanding uh, seniors and also uh, the challenges of ambassadors and also the staff that manage the ambassador, we call that. But before that, um, I'm already in the uh, volunteering uh, uh, work. Uh, and, and largely because of the study that I have here, actually very much like my class work. <laughs> I am a student of aging, uh, all right? uh, so gerontology, that's the big word. But actually studying about aging and uh, after that, what's the purpose of studying aging if you don't? do something about it. So I just volunteer in a senior activity center. And after that, I lead the alumni chairman, and then we do the whole ecosystem approach. And these are some of the photos, right? We started this senior sports day, and that was why uh, give me a lot of insight that seniors need to exercise. And actually, everybody needs to exercise, but how to exercise in a fun and inclusive way. And uh, at the end of the, this uh, Senior Sports Day, we uh, bring St. Liu and also uh, Sesco to do competition. And through the competition, uh, and then I realized uh, everybody have a fighting spirit and competitive spirit. <laughs> the Amma run so fast, I was so worried. Uh, how <laughs> yeah, Amma slow down. <laughs> Although I got ambulance standby, uh, but I don't want uh, any uh, challenge. Uh. Uh, and, and what I learned the most from the event is really about that. Uh, uh, the seniors came uh, to me and said, Hey, Sisiani, thank you very much. Sisiani, well, I'm sinking, I'm, I'm exhilarated, I'm excited. All right, and uh, you see all of them wearing their medals, uh, and we give everyone a medal because everybody is a winner. And after that, they wear this medal home and show their. <laughs> so, see, that changed the perception of senior, right? And uh, that's the role that I have a volunteer. I learned the most. And when I visit later another activity center, I saw the medal hang at the activity center. Then I said, How come this medal is hanging here? They say, The senior say, I want to inspired the rest to join the next year. So I want to say this is a positive ripple effect of volunteerism. You don't know where the positive benefits or outcome impact would happen. All right? And, uh, and then after that, I land up in Active AG and do a senior sports day at the national level. But it comes uh, from my little volunteer effort. Right. And I, I like uh, Mr. Don here, he took leave to come here. Uh, I, I also took leave uh, to do volunteer work. <laughs> and I used to be a military, uh, work in the military, uh, some of my friends here. All right. uh, and of course, don't wear in army, uh, the uniform then, the senior is quite scared, right? Okay, then uh, I also want to say on this picture on the right, actually, uh, it's also that volunteerism sometimes don't have to have structure. Uh. This one uh, is actually an uh, interest group in uh, Jurong West. And, uh, the person inside is a, the leader is an informal leader. It's not a secret society leader, all right? <laughs> Called Li Ping. Uh, she's now like my godmother. 
amazing. Uh, before I doing my uh, research work, and I found out that how this senior come about together doing exercise was because there was an informal leader without the formal structure. But she built the trust through relationship. And I am very supportive of them, so I'm the person in white. So we went to Protanic Garden on uh, New Year Eve. And I find that was the most uh, memorable moment for me uh, to celebrate uh, New Year, right? Uh, exercising with the senior. And the one short story is that uh, I was talking to one senior, a uh, Malay uh, uh, lady. Then she told me that before she joined she, this interest group, she was on a wheelchair. After that, she graduated to walking stick. On the walk, she walked independently without a walking stick. <laughs> Then we talk, then I say, wow, oh, you see, you validated my theory. It's re reversible one. Muscle loss is reversible. After talk, 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 hey, how about your son and all this? Little did I know, uh, his son is my colleague. Uh. <laughs> then we took a picture and he was sitting a few office from me. So you never know your good work or the work that you do, number one, actually will impact somebody's mother, father, and uh, it may be just your colleagues. So I just want to share a little quote from Gandhi. All right? We find ourselves when we lose ourselves serving other people. So that is the whole spirit of volunteerism. All right? So this is about myself. So this is my organization. I want to pay tribute to first all my silver generation office leader. Amazing work that they have done. And you may be familiar with the pioneer generation uh, package. So we started as a scheme-based type of uh, uh, outreach, uh, uh, pioneer, then after that, Medica Generation, then we merged with AIC. So, Silver Generation Office was once an agency by itself, then we merged. And then uh, after that, COVID, la, like everybody knows, but seniors are the most affected group. La, all right? So, they do a lot of uh, work behind the scene, braving the risk of being infected. All right? Uh, medical escorts, uh, meals on wheels, and things like that. And now, we are moving into a preventive health type of engagement in line with the healthier SG. All right. So I want to give credit to all the Silver Generation Office leaders as well as the ambassadors. All right. Good job that they have done. And uh, I want to share a few uh, ideas that we are thinking about. One is this uh, idea about uh, volunteerism without boundaries. All right. And whole idea is really about a cause, a meaning, and purpose. And just now, in the whole conference, we talked about a lot about this uh, whole ecosystem approach. Like, huh? People, uh, sector, like all of you, you need volunteer, right? Then, public sector have the resources, have the structure, have the process. Private sectors have the resources in terms of maybe uh, in kind. How do we put all this together? If we can put all this together, then I think we can create a sustainable voluntary, volunteerism system. And uh, this conference itself is a show of this, I mean, a demonstration of this view of the whole ecosystem. But more importantly, I think as a country, is really instead of just chasing for the 5C, right? You all know cash and all this stuff, right? But we have world class infrastructure, we have world class software, hardware, software education, but do we have world class? Hardware, and I think that is called compassion, right? And this is even more important when we are moving into a fast aging population. Not just aging population, but fast aging population. When I was uh, driving from NUS uh, to here because there was a book launch on uh, aging, and PM was there. A uh, friend also asked me, hey, "How far are we from Japan?" <laughs> yes. Ask me 10 years, 15 years, I think less than that. Uh. Because 2030, uh, one quarter of population already 65 and above. One quarter, 900,000. Uh, that's the kind of uh, discussion we have here every Saturday, Sunday when I was doing my aging course uh, all right? uh, called gerontology. So, do you take another 1 million, say 1 million of seniors that is uh, 65 and above? Do we take another one million to take care of them? Then how many millions do we have working in the economy? I think this is some, a, a, a question that we need to ask ourselves. How do we unlock those constraints, the manpower constraints? If we can, everybody just chip in 
all right? Instead of just doing a good act, but now put volunteerism as a lifetime role, then I think probably we can solve that equation. Okay? Even as a silver generation uh, office, uh, we have only 3,000 volunteers. 3,000, not very little. Uh, but to outreach to 1 million, uh, how long do we need to take? <laughs> so that's something we are seriously thinking about. So digitalization, expanding our volunteer pool is really one of the key things. So to me, I think volunteerism is a lifetime role beyond family, beyond work role. Why? Okay, so that's my reflection on aging. Aging, a lot of time we always see the visible. It's called loss of function and abilities. Correct? Eyes cannot see so clearly. Ear cannot see so uh, That's how I usually do eye tests for my senior that I outreach. Uh. I say, Ama, what handsome boy? Ah, uh, handsome, okay, uh, your eyes very good. <laughs> handsome, uh, okay. Joking. Uh, huh? Then, uh, Hey, what am I saying just now? <laughs> After tell jobs, we can ah, I'm handsome, correct. Right. Thank you very much for your validation. <laughs> but you are more handsome. All right. <laughs> so, it's beyond just the loss of function abilities. What is most critical, right, actually for aging, right, like all of us, uh, is the loss of roles. Called role less. Why? When we age, uh, our kids will grow up. Then your parents' role will reduce. Our parents will age. Parents one day will go to heaven. Huh? Then you have your child role will be minus off. Then you retire. Suddenly you are CEO. <laughs> you can be a manager. You leave that room. Huh? You have no more role. Then you have an emptiness. Huh? Then your friends also start to go heaven earlier. Then you got friendless. Eventually, you will become role-less. So volunteerism, I believe, fit into the identity of an individual. And if everybody take this perspective, the question that through our life stages, how do we volunteer? Every life stages will have its demand. The question is, how can we unpack this from a supply perspective, right? And from a demand perspective, how do we unpack that? I think if we can do that, then in the end, we are all in search of the meaning and the purpose at all level. And I think from that perspective, we are also thinking about how to professionalize the volunteer force. I say volunteer force uh, is not workforce. How we describe volunteer is very, very important. How do we all describe your volunteer in the organization? Who call hands and legs? <laughs> it's the Hokkien Tao Ka Tao Chiu, basically do the Sai Kang, right? So who want to do Sai Kang? Some is called workforce, that means kind of do my work, but don't get paid. So I think words have meaning. So even how we describe volunteer uh, is important. So uh, in my organization, when I go in, I say, stop this type of work. <laughs> work, all right, and be very conscious about this. All right, volunteer drive on meaning and purpose, and work has meaning. All right, they are not hands and legs. They have a person that come with full heart and sometimes a lot of hates and expertise. So how do we maximize the expertise aligning the cause, the meaning and purpose. But it's more than that. A lot of time we also discuss about how to incentivize. The question is actually can we unlock that incentivize even training and building learning system into the volunteer. That means they, they are working with IHL, we can actually accredite their prior learning or experience as a volunteer force. Actually, they have a lot of experience. Number two is they can top up with uh, courses. Let's say like uh, here, community of care, caregiving and that. After that, can they get some certification? And after accreditation, can they go out to contribute in the sector they believe in? For example, a caregiver, a homemaker. 
can she do that volunteer work, get some accreditation, top up with some certificate in the IHL like SUSS, then after that they can have the cert and continue. So volunteerism is not just about giving, they are also the one that is receiving. All right, so uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Hawklin. Yeah. Last but not least, uh, we have Ms. Tumina uh, from PPIS. Okay, so I'll just pass the mic and the clicker to her. Yeah. Hello, good Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, how many of you know what PPIS is? Oh, yes, this one, two. Okay, that's good, yeah. So, uh, let me go through. This is PPIS and it's actually a volunteer-driven organization. It was set up 71 years ago and that was in 1952 and it started with these lovely ladies here, 22 of them, uh, and they started to champion women's rights. It was a period whereby uh, there were divorces, women were unemployed, uh, no education, so there needed to be a, a space for them to turn to and there wasn't any. So these 22 women, uh, women actually got together and then create opportunities for advancement and progress for Muslim women. It was not an easy thing to do for them at that point because the, the men were against them, you know, saying that, why do you do this to, my, to the women? Why do you influence them in that way? So, but they, they persevered on and actually one of them, uh, Madam Khatijun, passed away recently on International Women's Day. She's the one who actually fought for women a lot. Yeah, so uh, she was 96 when she passed on, yeah. So, uh, fast forward to today, 71 years later, we have 17 centres altogether. One is a SIM Academy and then uh, two family service centres and then we have four specialised service centres. These are catered for minor marriages and, uh, and uh, divorce support specialist agency, fostering agency as well as um, one that it caters to for remarriages. Yeah. And then we also have seven preschool centres you know, and uh, two student cares and the latest addition to our suite of services would be the rise above halfway house, that is to uh, cater to the needs of the female ex-offenders. Yeah. Uh, so if you can see that it's such a big organisation, we have like uh, not only 17 centres, but we have 300 staff altogether. And uh, these centres are, are all catered towards the different needs of the uh, community. And uh, in the past, volunteerism was something that's just on uh, Excel sheet. The database is that, and then we, there's no really uh, a structure for this. And uh, to think that we were started by 22 volunteers, but we did not go through the whole structure of having a, a framework of volunteerism. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about institutionalizing volunteer management practice in PPIS, we were looking at developing the capabilities and capacity of the strategic management and mobilization of volunteers. What we wanted to do was to enhance service delivery. And we want to improve professionalism of volunteer management. And uh, of course, we want to move to Excel sheet to VMS, volunteer management system on Sierra. And thankfully, we were able to do that with uh, NCSS support. Uh, we never had one volunteer manager. There's always one person doing volunteer management, but at the same time, she's doing a lot of other things here. Yeah. So in 2021, when we got a funding from NCSS, we actually got one person to, do, uh, to focus on volunteer management. And that's when the whole journey started, yeah, when uh, we got all the system in oh. place. Yeah. So uh, what we did was like we, what we went on doing the volunteer engagement framework and then of course buying in from staff is quite difficult because they were all doing their own things actually. Uh, some of them were saying, oh, I got my, my friends can become my volunteers, that kind of thing. So there was no actually uh, a structure whereby volunteers are recruited and, and, and into a, a kind of database where we can have more uh, streamlined effort, you see. So we needed to get the staff buy-in, and that was the leadership is very important. The leadership who believe in volunteerism, uh, the leadership who actually, you know, uh, thinks that there is a way to move forward. And I, I shared Hocklin's uh, view about being a volunteer, because I, I was a volunteer myself. When, we, when I was in MCCY, we started a program called the uh, Project Empower, whereby we did a befriending service. And I, and I was doing the program and actually uh, uh, offered myself to be one of the befrienders. And that's where we learned what's happening on the ground and we, we were able to manage the expectation, yeah. So beyond that, uh, we have regular roles to foster strong culture volunteerism. 
uh, meaning that they will grow attached to the organisation and then we actually redesign some of the volunteer roles to uh, alleviate staff workload. This is not to say that we they take over the work of the staff, but certain areas of work where the staff can be, can be done by the volunteers, then the staff can focus on the more high order work. Yeah. So uh, we have a, a central, now it used to be a decentralized uh, volunteer manager at all the different centers, but now we have a centralized volunteer management. And uh, we work with volunteer coordinators at every center. So there's one at the head office, the volunteer manager, and she works with all the volunteer coordinators at the 17 centers that we have. Yeah. And uh, that really helps because then we know what's happening and we know how to redeploy, how to mobilize volunteers you know, at, at certain points. Yeah. And we also developed the volunteer continuity plan thanks to NCSS too. And so we would ensure that a volunteer would remain even during a crisis. Yeah. And of course, the, the whole works of retention, training and appreciation of volunteers, all those things are what some of the works that we do. So uh, we, we actually got a CMS uh, that, that really helps in tracking the volunteers' contribution. And we were able to identify and develop leaders, those who have done more, I see. Yeah. So uh, networking events was something that we do on a regular basis. Uh, like in, in May, we're having a popcorn movie night you know, for the volunteers. So that really helps them feel appreciated. At the same time, it was an occasion for them to share best practices and exchange valuable insights. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's a uh, volunteer. Okay, but in PPIS itself for the staff, we know that uh, there's only so much that we can do with the volunteers, but we also want staff to feel that they, they, want, they are able to volunteer too. So we have started this one-day volunteer leave for every staff where they can volunteer at any of our centres or any at the other centres. So uh, other centres meaning non-PPI centres. So that really helps to, to make them, because we know that all of them are already volunteers, so why not give them that one day of volunteer leave for them to do, you know? Yeah. And uh, last year in December, we started the PPI's Giving Week. That was really uh, something uh, very uh, heartwarming because we had all our staff to go to free food for all and help the, you know, to them with their agricultural, you know, their urban farming. Yeah. So it was really a learning uh, process for them. And of course, National Day Celebration is when we get all our staff to volunteer and uh, do hampers. You know, and, and now we are, we are able to track volunteer hours for staff too. So it's not just the volunteers that we're tracking, but for staff. Because we want to be able to, to sort of uh, commend them for what they do. And of course, the volunteer opportunity within PPS. We are also looking into like, uh, working with SIF, Singapore International Foundation, whereby our staff can go overseas for some humanitarian... Uh, you know, so the volunteer journey doesn't stop, uh, it will continue and I think in PPIS we were able to manage this and we were able to, uh, we want to celebrate volunteerism because we started as, a vo as an organisation that was driven by volunteers, so this is the way forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Domina. Yeah. As we get, uh, can we just give a round of applause to our speakers for sharing? Yeah, they put in a lot of effort to prepare the slides. Yeah. So uh, before I go into questions, uh, maybe I would like to find out more about our audience here, uh, since I think Hocklin has helped me to do a bit of polling earlier on, right? Want to find out uh, amongst our audience here? Okay, any of you all from your respective organisations, you all have a dedicated VM. If you have a dedicated VM, raise your hand. Your organisation has someone that is really a dedicated volunteer manager. None? Okay, maybe one person, one person over there, or two. Okay, then in that case, right, how many of you, how many of your organizations rather, you have a VM that double head? That means this person may be a social worker plus VM, or a counselor plus VM, or program executive plus VM. Show of hands. Okay, that's quite common. <laughs> okay, right, yeah. So uh, thank you all for sharing. Uh, I think that one of the things that uh, we heard from the three speakers here was where, uh, first and foremost, there is a turning point uh, in their leadership in, in, in to put more emphasis on volunteerism. Yeah, and that's where the transition happens. And uh, for each of these organizations, they decided to embark on a very, very uh, uncharted uh, journey 
of uh, getting a dedicated volunteer manager. So maybe I want to start off right, by asking right, all our three speakers was that what was this turning point right, for you personally when you lead your respective organisations that you said, that, hey, we really must look into uh, volunteers seriously and start to beef up efforts and to the point that I would like to uh, even hire or, or, or get tap on funding to get a dedicated uh, volunteer manager to look into this uh, whole uh, aspect of work la, for your organization. Yeah, maybe I start off by asking Melissa. Yeah, come. I think like I shared, the turning point for uh, Bates was actually COVID because I mean, the team is really small and kind of I just joined the agency and actually my background was, I was a volunteer management also when I was at HCSA then, so I was double heading. So when we kind of needed to tap on volunteers and the, the half head count that I was, uh, by my colleague that I was working in, because she's doing social media and volunteer management, it's very, very different. So you can't have the best of both worlds. So each time, I mean, when we needed um, help and all, like who can we go to? And we can't always tap on staff. And during that period, it was very, very trying because people were taking turns to catch COVID. So there's no way you could come down and it's contactless. Yeah. So we are already down in doing our core work, but we still need to support. So that's, that's yeah. where we, we, I mean, we had the opportunity for SG United and that came in very, very timely. Yeah. We could see that with that role of volunteer management, it helped move things. Yeah, because before that, we weren't even sure where we are in the volunteer matrix, where are we lacking, who are the volunteers that we could tap on. And we are always constantly tapping on people who respond to us. But how about those who we are not um, in, in touch with or are not coming back? We don't have that, that bandwidth to even have that regular contact to find out who we, we could tap on. So I would say that that was our turning point. COVID allowed for innovation and uncharted waters. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Maybe I pass on to Hocklin. Okay. Yeah, for, for Hocklin, it will be slightly different because we know that AIC has been very established yeah. uh, with SGO and uh, the SGS, um, uh, SGA. La. So what prompted you uh, as, as chief to really look into putting more effort into this area? Maybe I share with a few perspectives. Huh? Uh, so one as a chief SGO and then the other one as an individual. La. So I see that number one um, is how we view volunteerism. All right, I always ask this question, uh, hands or legs, then some backbone, some is called, uh, um, some is called head, some heart. Lah, all right? Then I say, if your organisation really anchors on volunteerism, uh, like the people sector, uh, then it's a live blood. It's blood cell. <laughs> you must grow your blood cell more than de decay then your body can grow. So it's no blood cell, then the body dies. Ah. Right, so is that your organisation? So then it's about scale. Ah, all right? So that's first perspective. Ah. So that is the criticality of volunteerism in your work, whether it's this, uh, people sector or national. So at the national level, this is important right, for us because I, our challenge statement is exponential function of an aging population. It goes this way, right? 3,000, not enough. Now, how to expand our volunteer call? So then I have to organize volunteer management system. So that's how I think about it. But management is just about allocation of resources, HR function. What is more important is leadership for volunteerism. Every hierarchy must own the volunteer. So, volunteer management is just one key function, but everybody through the whole organization. So, my division leaders on the ground, every leader is a volunteer leader. Ah, so, then it's how you unlock those constraints. Ah. <laughs> okay. So, I, I know a lot of non-profit uh, sector will say, ah, not enough people. Actually, there will always be not enough people. But how do you unlock those? Second one is if you recruit volunteer management that have HR expertise, can they support you? Right. So using the expert, then you can unlock that already. Right. So, and the other aspect, of course, from our SGO perspective, if I increase the scale, then even the number of people may not be enough. Then I always describe is the rabbit and the turtle race. Ah. Right. Last time. Rabbit went to sleep, right? The turtle still can work very hard. <laughs> Today, rabbit have woke up and run very fast, and it's an exponential function. Turtle work very, run very fast, still will lose the race. Then what must turtle do? 
take MRT. <laughs> we have to have technology. We have to data, digitalization, data transformation. That is the kind of work we are doing at the national level because cannot be done by one agency. All right. So the scale could be quite different, but I think it's the mindset. We need to shift our mindset. All right. Management to leadership to looking inside how to unlock our constraint, then looking from volunteer perspective, how to tap their expertise, as well as the public sector, the IHL, to come in to lend their resources. Then I think together we can unlock this constraint. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hocklin. Yep. Uh, I'll be very candid about it, actually, you know, how we, uh, the impetus for getting a volunteer management is, a volunteer manager is because of the funding from NCSS. It wasn't much of a priority because we thought that all along, oh, um, someone can double head, can triple head, why not, you see, and, you know, work gets around. But we realised that we wanted to do more and we were setting up the women's space also coming up end of this year. So we know that it has got to be volunteer driven when you talk about women's space. And we, we, when we know that we are going to have rust, uh, the halfway house, that's another volunteer driven because the skill based volunteers that come in, uh, is, there's so much potential in that. So that's why we, 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 uh, you know, we, we did the volunteer management. And, and, and it, was a, it was really a good thing because then we started on the journey. And now we're looking back, like uh, when we talk about the halfway house, uh, although we have staff, 11 staff working there, but a lot of the work over the weekend is done by volunteers. They come in to do, <coughs> to do like uh, gardening, the edible garden that we have. They come in and do uh, skill, um, uh, writing a resume for them for employability. Then we have image mission to come in with grooming and all that, how to make sure that the staff, and even cooking and all that. So that is really key for us, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks uh, our speakers for sharing this. Maybe I just want to uh, ask the next question was, is that uh, what was some of the challenges you encounter when trying to institutionalize it, uh, VM, in, in your organization? And then subsequently, right, what was the benefits that it brought about for your organization that previously your organization could not do? Yeah, maybe Melissa want to start first? I, I think for us, the, the challenge is getting the buy-in because I think for, for staff, we're not used to having volunteer in every part of our work. So it, that took probably about a year to, to get started because there's always hesitant. And sometimes it's working and having that relationship with the volunteer. So you kind of need to get to know and even know what are the work that you can, you can um, kind of task to the volunteer and have that trust that it will work out. Yeah, because there's, with the hesitant and then you're not able to let go, then things can't move, then you end up being doing a lot more. So sometimes there's always this mindset, if I can do it, it'll be much faster. Why do I need to? But you're looking at a marathon, so you kind of need to pace yourself. And by being able to scope out work that volunteer can support with, you can do the higher order work like what uh, Madam Tumina was saying. Thanks. Any one of you would like to share? I suppose like Melissa is buying in from staff also because um, we, we, we feel that some of them will think that, oh, they're going to take away our job, you see. So that is quite, uh, you know, a pressing thing. So, but we managed to convince them that, and over, the, over time, they realised that, wow, the volunteers actually helped them. Like, recently we had a video done by a volunteer videographer. So can you imagine the amount of money that we save as well as the time, uh, the staff time and all that. So uh, these are the benefits of having uh, skill-based volunteers that we have in PPIS. And they come in with different expertise. Uh, and then uh, we, we actually got them to, you know, s like, like for, for, for the, our student care centres, we have two of them. I think uh, Hockley will be familiar with some of the work that we do at the student care. We had these volunteers who are actually alumni from the centres. Mm -hmm. They leave the student care centres, they are in poly, and they come back and volunteer. And these people are just like, they are, you know, the big sister and big brother to all this. So they, they actually inspire the students to do more. Yeah. So uh, those are the benefits. And we increased the pool of volunteers over the last two years, actually, uh, by 50%. So that's, that's uh, a huge. And then they're always there. And I, I just want to share one volunteer that whom we have. is a transport minder. She does regular role, whereby she uh, transport uh, foster children to their medical appointment when the foster parents are not able to do it or to meet their natural parents. And she's been with us for like more than 10 years and at every event you see her and she's 79 years old. 
a, a Chinese lady. It's, it's so heartwarming to see her every time, yeah. So these are the benefits that we have of volunteer, yeah. So um, uh, some of the challenges that I see, a uh, few experience, maybe Active AG, also my current experience, and then as previous as a volunteer. Of course, uh, one is really the mindset. Uh, uh, it's like, you know, uh, I, I, I use a metaphor called water. La. Last time we had to depend on only one country for water, right? So we have no water. La. Then what do we need to do? We invent new water. <laughs> Correct. So same thing. La. Last time we have this amount of volunteer. Then we have to find now the more volunteers, la, right? So the mindset is you have to unlock this. La. What is the other source? La? Right. So the other source could be the institutes of higher learning, or MOE, corporate. La. But then you have to go into that whole system to understand, ma, because it's not easy to pull them out, right? So, uh, so what we have done, one of the ways really to unlock that constraint and say that put that volunteerism into the curriculum. So we work with a uh, uh, NUS client um, uh, engagement pillar, and then now it's part of the curriculum. And uh, we started with one, and uh, I'm not sure any of my friends is here. One of my friends, actually, one of the Saturday, we have an informal session. Then he walked over and thanked me and said, Hoklin, thanks for making a difference to my daughter. Huh? What, what did I do to your daughter? I'm very worried. Yeah, like. yeah. <laughs> they say, what difference did I do, positive one or negative one? <laughs> they say, no, because uh, my daughter, after become a silver generation ambassador from NUS, they say NUS, when she come back, she got experience meeting all the seniors at the dinner table. You're sharing about his, her experience seeing peop, uh, peop, uh, people with dementia, talk about the parents aging. And, and the couple, uh, my friend and his wife, was like so amazed. He's like, oh, New York, Zhang Da. It's like, your daughter had grown up. And to me, that's the most important thing about volunteerism, right? We sit the compassion and empathy in our youth. If our every youth grow up, take care of their parents, we have less to do. Right? Now, instead of we getting the volunteer and keep doing the outreach, now we also add the social value and really the value of compassion and empathy. So the impact multiply. Right? From constraint to multiplier effect. So that is a mindset shift, right? Similarly for corporate volunteerism, and then you have to talk co corporate language. Like I'm not a private person, right? But it's still P and L, right? Top line, bottom line, right? But how does volunteerism help top line, bottom line, right? So just now you heard it's team building, right? New skills, right? Leadership skills, conversation. These are very difficult thing in dynamic organization, right? So. And we need to see their tempo of every organization. Or everyone is quite different. So that could be one way that we can unlock. All right? So number one is a mindset shift. But when we open up the new pipeline, uh, so you have new water, uh, what are the challenges? <laughs> Your training can cope or not? You've got enough sub, uh, demand to cope or not? You don't want so many people to sit down and then waste time, right? Like uh, uh, last time, army always say, uh, Wait to rush, rush to wait, right? <laughs> it can be like that, right? So that will be the challenge. Then we need to see end-to-end -end and sort out our internal value chain, all right? And the other one is once you open up the pipe, uh, you also invite all kinds of people to come in. Uh, this is usually unsaid, but on the ground, sometimes you also find diverse people. I just want to put it diverse people. <laughs> not easy to get. And uh, when we say, just now it's red blood cell, right? What happens if you have mutated blood cell? What kind of disease will you get? Huh? Cancer. Very challenging. So we need to make sure we also keep our filter system very tight. This is my learning. When you go with mass, you also have to do your risk management and also your asset management. We usually don't talk about that. But from my lesson learned, you need to go to the ground. That's why the leader first must be a volunteer. And then you, your ears are on the ground, you know what is happening. Yeah, that's my, uh, 
my feedback and my reflection. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Hong Lin. Yeah, uh, I'm a bit mindful of time, so I'm just gonna do a quick wrap up uh, before I open up time for Q and A. Yeah, I think I really appreciate our three speakers sharing uh, from three different agencies, uh, different uh, sizes of their agency. Yeah, and I think what Hong Lin really really struck me was the need to digitize, the need to leverage on technology the need to view volunteers in a very different way, uh, as well as ownership at every level of the management. Yeah, I think uh, Ms. Tumina brought up a very good point about how uh, PPI started as a volunteer-driven organization. And now with a dedicated volunteer manager and a proper, uh, even a, a, a sound uh, organization system, yeah, how are they going to be able to augment the work and expand the work? and take the burden off staff. I think for Melissa, uh, the greatest takeaway will be really uh, how BAPES uh, start off but, uh, really looking at <laughs> that less than 20 headcount and then see, okay, we really need to do something about it if, because of COVID. And how does the pandemic really uh, drive uh, uh, Melissa and the team to even look into volunteerism uh, seriously? La. Yeah, so I really want to thank uh, the three speakers. Uh, before I go into time of Q&A, if there's one tip uh, to share with our audience here, knowing that they're all from the uh, social sector, uh, what would it be with regards to institutionalizing volunteer management uh, in their respective organization? Sure. I think for us, our, our agency is small, so it's a lot of trial and error. So I mean, it's okay to make mistakes as long as they're not dry. So sometimes it's probably easier to say sorry than to seek approval. So at times, it's really just trying and see how it goes. Because sometimes if you wait and seek too much approval, time will pass. So it's like really seizing the opportunity and see what could work because you never know what turns out. And at, at, at the end of the day, you would win more than more you lose. La. Yeah. So that's my take. Great. Thank you. So for me, it's uh, I. La. So um, institution, start with individual. And then as an individual, talk less, do more. All right? And uh, walk the ground. Ground experience is our best teacher. Mm. And when you do small, think big. Uh, then I think it's all integrated. Right, thanks. I suppose from experience, I'm pretty new in PPI, it's actually only less than four years, but uh, I think it's the leadership that's important because before I came on board, there wasn't any interest in having a proper volunteer manager. Yeah? So it's a leadership, it's, uh, it's ensuring that uh, you engage the staff you know, to make sure that uh, there is a culture of volunteerism. The value of what volunteer to bring to the organization, I think that's something that you really need to internalize in the staff, yeah, and see it positively, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, our speakers. Can we give them a round of applause for, their, for sharing their insights with us? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to open the time for Q&A. Uh, so I'll be moving around with the mic. Uh, so uh, feel free, uh, we don't have pigeonhole or slido for you all to put up your questions. So if anyone would like to ask a question to our speakers, uh, just raise your hand and uh, a, a mic will go to you for you to ask uh, the speaker. Anybody? Anyone? Come. Sorry, my name is Don. Um, once again, thank you for sharing your good work and thank you for serving the community. Do you leverage on social media to recruit volunteers? So for example, Hotline, you share an example about your friend's daughter uh, who had learned how to engage seniors. And youngsters these days, they have their social media, TikTok, Telegram, or Instagram. So do you think by leveraging on your volunteers' social media network and ask them to post some of their positive learning outcomes, do you think this will actually help your respective organizations to recruit more volunteers? Okay, I, I thanks uh, Don for the... He's my boss, uh, all right. My community leader. <laughs> so I, I want to say that uh, I believe in social media, and uh, it's, but you have to pitch it at the correct way. So we do use that, but uh, we do Facebook, uh, I do LinkedIn, uh, but not enough, because that is not for youth. Uh, and I fully support what the idea is, uh, user-generated uh, type of content. Uh, youthful stuff. Uh. <laughs> Facebook is really <laughs> of the past, right? So uh, TikTok. And, uh, and, uh, and that's why I, when I talk to NUS, uh, we, 
uh, my first learning was first I stepped into the training is we had to transform the way that we train because we use one standard package. And US students learn much faster, right? And then they learn differently. Uh, so then the training people start to think already. Second one, the comms people also start to think, hey, actually why I need to put my uh, factual type of uh, pose uh, on the media where it's not emotive and immediate, all right? So then you get, you will have multiplier effect. So I believe in that, uh, we are only starting to do that because our original thinking is silver generation volunteer is start with silver generation. <laughs> but to me is silver generation got, the silver and generation got two words, right? Silver is the new goal. So we get the silver volunteerism, right? But generation means intergeneration. So because of these two words, we will change the concept. So young and old all can volunteer. And then the media to young and old is different because it's media is just a means. Right? So we speak not just the language, but the means to get to different audience have to be different and targeted. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I just want to share about socials. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that we are a bit cautious. Yeah, because of PDPA and all that. So before we have our social media policy within the organization. So this is something we share with the volunteers because I, we don't want a situation whereby they post pictures of foster children, for instance. Yeah. So those are the areas of concern that we have when it comes to volunteers posting on their socials. Yeah. But we do have our own and that's how we get our... Vote. I just want to share also that we do a lot of cross-deployment of volunteers too. Like uh, recently someone, uh, Grace Haven, another person, wanted some... Uh, some Malay speaking volunteers to you know to cater to their parents. So that is what we do, yeah. So those things, yeah. I think for our side it's a bit different. So there is usually we are more cautious in terms of getting new volunteers because of volume, because we are so small. The current number of cases that we have is about 30, but we do need a lot of volunteers for our helpline. So when we put on social media, be it on our website, IG or Facebook, we do indicate like what are the roles that we want. So on our end we, we kind of like if we don't need then we just remove the post. Because we also do not want a case where we have an influx of volunteers and then after that we do the orientation and then we're unable to match them, then they, they will lose interest. Because once volunteers are not able to engage or do then they will just move on. Yeah, so we do not want to create that. So on our end, I think the, the policy is a bit like, if we don't need, then we don't put it up so that we, we don't um, yeah, waste, waste their time in that sense. Huh? Yeah, so it's okay to say no to volunteers. Yeah, thanks. Uh, would there be any other questions from the audience? Right. Oh, okay. Oh, the lady first. Yeah. I just have a question about um, training. So I know that, of course, different types of volunteers would require a different level of training. So my question is, how do you first, how do you screen your volunteers to make sure that they are appropriate for the role. Of course, you can test, you know, the first card level of training where you list the requirements and you take it that people who don't meet the requirements may not apply, but I'm sure sometimes there are also cases where you get an influx of interest and not all of them are suitable. So how do you ensure that you have the right people and also how do you ensure that they uh, meet the necessary standards? Is there a training framework or a training roadmap you have in place? And if they do not meet those requirements, I suppose in a more, um, from a comms perspective, how do you gently tell them that, you know, they are not ready for the role yet? No? Or, you know, in Hocklin's words or so, you know, exit them in a nice way as well. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, for our work, is uh, really important uh, because uh, one, we are probably the only organisation uh, that senior uh, allow us to go into their house. And uh, it's not just one lock. Uh, our house nowadays got many locks. Uh. <laughs> At least two or three locks, <laughs> and uh, and then after that, tell their uh, lifetime a story with us uh, through that one hour, and uh, I and I put myself as a son. All right, do you want anyone to talk to your mother at home or father? So that's why screening for us is absolutely important because uh, we make sure the trust and relationship must be maintained. That's our premium. All right. So of course for us, screening is key, right? Security and all those. So it's a little bit tighter. Lah. And then I just want to assure all of you, uh, allow us to go to your house. <laughs> <laughs> then the training framework for us is because we are like uh, aging and engagement. So it's evidence-based. So we definitely have a, 
uh, that kind of training framework and uh, even has support from sociologists and all uh, well researched but simplified. Lah. But we also, in the training approach, uh, we not just have the classroom uh, training, we also have on the job training. So the on the job training allow us to see whether uh, first the person has the right heart or not. Lah. All right. Most important, right? Not just the head knowledge. Head knowledge, all this hands on can learn. Right? All right. But if, let's say, the person does not really have the right heart in place, then that may be during the OJT, instead of a committing for such a long term, then we may uh, gently suggest that, you know, can consider do other stuff. Lah. And what we are trying to do now is then, uh, this is like our gold standard, right? Uh, we are also trying to, not say silver standard, but other roles, lah, uh, more gen generic, like organizing conference, events. Uh, so these are the kind of roles. Then we have other roles, then we can fit more people. But if you have only one role, then that will be challenging. So in summary, what I'm trying to say, number one, if you have to have some kind of screening, depending on your organization. I'm, I'm from a public agency, so we have the kind of resources. But from a non-profit one, you have to think about how you want to screen them. Not screening, I don't think is correct. Too tight is also not right. So the answer must be in between. Then in your tr training also, don't forget some of the adult learner don't need to train everything. <laughs> That's also another challenge that we have. We treat them like kids, right? Because they come with experience. If we can balance that, then I think we will have a more efficient and effective way of training. And then you, during that training, you need some way to sort of uh, do a water test, a litmus test, then you continue that. Because once they come into the system, uh, it can be a bit challenging. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we do screening at our end too, but uh, because we are different from the, the work that Hoglin does, the volunteer like visiting homes, we don't get volunteers to visit homes, that's for sure. It's more on events or more, it's more on skill-based kind of thing. So our screening is less vigorous, yeah. But ensuring that they attend training and all that before they, you know, there's, there's always the onboarding before they, they come. I mean, when they sign up as a volunteer, there's onboarding process. And that's when we talk about PPIS as an organization, yeah. And then training is as and when, uh, it depends on the kind of volunteers that we want to, yeah. So we, we provide that, yeah. Just a quick one. So ours is quite similar, but uh, for critical roles like the helpliners and uh, befrienders, we do have a contract. So it's like a six months renewal. So sometimes we kind of use that as a, a point of review. Yeah. Like, you know, you're not suitable. And then we, we find that it, it, with the contract, it kind of makes it easy for exit. Yeah, because sometimes if it's not documented and we say that we'll try for six months, there is no clear cut. Like sometimes we kind of just need that paper there just to help us uh, to move some of the things. Just want to add on that uh, it's not everything's uh, so bad, but when the right people with the right hearts come together, uh, actually the challenge is you cannot contain them, and uh, there's really a lot of commitment. So like uh, a Good Friday Eve, right? Uh, we know and myself were at one training session, and a lot of time holiday Eve, where do we? Where are we? We are at the pub la, watch movie la. This volunteer on a Good Friday Eve do comedy or practice to share their experience. To me, it's like, wow, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, till 9 o'clock. So once you put this group of people, after you settle all this, and then you put in the body system and uh, where you, uh, peer learning, that kind of stuff, it's amazing. That is the power of volunteerism. Even you can't find it in the workplace. <laughs> I'm very sure none of us uh, at work uh, will stay voluntarily uh, uh, during holiday eve to discuss about our work. <laughs> but volunteer can. So different, right? And that's why I was so inspired that I post uh, about them and say that, hey, this one, uh, I think workplace also cannot happen. Right? So that is the magic of volunteerism. Right? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was told that we, our time is a bit up because the next group is waiting outside. Uh, yeah, so, uh, maybe you ask first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come, Thank you. go ahead. Uh, my name is Herman. I'm from the mosque. So the question I have is that uh, what software, what CRM that you provide to your VM, and what do you mainly use that software for? Link, you want to share your secret? What software? CRM one. You use uh, NCSS one? Uh, SGCAS. Uh, we usually use, we, we use Salesforce. 
yeah, that's the main platform. And we have the VMS, and within that Salesforce, we have donor management system, volunteer management system, even uh, yeah, member management, yeah. So we do that, yeah. Actually, feel free to, to get in touch with our IT guy if you want to find out more. Seriously, yeah. There are some tender of this type of stuff, yeah, around. Yeah, 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 similar. Yeah, yeah similar. Ours is a. I'll make it quick. Uh, hi, my name is Lynn from um, ASESGO. So um, currently, we have a form-based system um, where we don't. Re we are currently working on a volunteer management system, um, but at this juncture, we have been using a very form-based system where we have different kind of modules and drop-down lists for us to input the data in there to capture the system. So as to your question, we don't really have. We are still working towards a volunteer management system as a whole. So so that we can do everything uh, via that platform, but right, right now, uh, unfortunately, uh, not at the moment. And uh, I, I challenge myself, we have world-class infrastructure, them solid, right? Your friends come, oh, Singapore, very beautiful, all these things. We got world-class education, right? Uh, but do we have world-class hardware? All right, so we hardware, software, do we have? I think the next group of development is really about hardware, all right? Can we feel it? Can we think about it? And then can we act on it? So I think volunteerism play a very big part in this. I call 5C to 1C. Okay. Then my result is always C. That's why I always C. B and A, I don't know how to do. So uh, then uh, the other one is actually inspired by this book called Victor Frankl. It's about uh, In Search of Meaning. So I thought In Search of Meaning uh, for an individual, a very average person like us, even going through COVID, all experience. Uh, uh, is maybe you can find meaning through volunteerism. Uh. And that's my also little experience that I have. And it's not a, like a one-time act, law, do good uh, here, do good there, <laughs> then or volunteer. But it must be a lifetime role. Uh. And uh, because I'm a student of uh, gerontology, aging, and I always think about uh, aging, sometimes people say about fertility, loss of function, loss of abilities. But the bigger challenge is the invisible one. It's actually loss of roles. Why loss of roles? Uh, first, you retire, you don't have work role. Uh, so you see CEO today very wow, very proud. Once they finish the job, uh, hey, no more CEO. You go to copy them. Uh, who sucks out you CEO or not? <laughs> Still queue up and buy the copy, right? Or general or whatever. La. So you lose the work role. Then the identity. La. Then your family also, parents will grow old, go to heaven, right? So your children role also. Kids grow up, empty nest, also no role already. Parents also no role, right? Then friends also go to heaven, also no role, <laughs> less role. So you become role-less. Then after that, after that, after that slowly, role-less. And I, when I visit nursing home, that's what I see. Lor, because there's no identity, there's no role. Why they want to wake up? Why they want to get out on the bed? So I think besides doing for the seniors, how to do have to build that role. And I think volunteerism can build that role since young. Or, and then if we start that reframing, maybe we can, right? And especially in the context of an aging population, fast aging population, how do we build that multiplier effect? So in Silver Generation Office, we have, uh, not bad, you see, we have 3,000 volunteers. Wow, sound quite big, right? My previous job is active actually 330,000 volunteers. Wow, big, right? Like, I want army, right? <laughs> then you're like, wow, so solid. What, huh? The senior we have uh, in 2030 uh, is 900,000, 1 million, 65 years old and above. How many people do we need? Hey, this one not my problem only. Eh. It's also your problem. Eh. All of us got parents, eh. right? Uh, this is the kind of challenge I came in. I, I, anyway, I'm two months as a chief of SGA, <laughs> civil generation office. So I said, no, we have to unlock this constraint. And then we have to expand quickly. Uh, but in terms of numbers, the way that we look at things, all right, uh, and then change the, our mindset, even digitalization and technology. All right. And there's another part about uh, professionalizing volunteer force. And I call volunteer force because I think words have meanings. How we describe our volunteer is already what we already thought of them consciously or subconsciously. So some of them like to call them hands and legs. 
Then I say, please. The Hokkien say, Tao Ka Chiu, you know. Tao Ka Chiu means do what? Do Sai Kang. Ah. So it's called Sai Kang Force. Right. Then why I want to volunteer? Right. So first thing is ourself. Lah. So, so how we describe. So I also want, don't want to describe that as workforce because it's not doing our work. Then it's like manipulation, you know. <laughs> so how, why would you want to volunteer if people, I want to stick out your work? Then why don't you pay me? All right, so that, is, that I say is volunteer force. But when volunteer force, we need to articulate the meaning and purpose behind. Then most important, I think, is this idea about building in learning structure and uh, training. It's not purely training, but build, uh, learning structure. Number one, the volunteer, they come with, come with different strengths and talents. Can we optimize and maximize lah, to that? But some of them don't want. They want to do simple job or other job so that they can learn something new. Eh? Right? Then we can also use that as a motivation to build a pathway, a learning pathway, then a volunteer pathway. How do we think about this? Then there's progression. People like to be motivated by mastery beyond autonomy and purpose. Right? So this is one area I'm thinking about. And and then we can collaborate with uh, IHL, uh, SUSS is one, and other agencies. Like how do we recognize the prior learning and recognize the prior experience and accredit those? Because those are invaluable. For example, caregiving of a person with dementia. The caregiver got the most experience that none, maybe the doctor also don't have. I'm very sure. Nurse, maybe. But do not to the full extent. Right? If we accredited them, then give them some community care uh, training, can they be the next tr uh, tr uh, coach or counsellor to this person with dementia? Why? Why, why I talk about this? Because in 2030, when there's 1 million of people 60 and above, uh, guess how many people with dementia? Make a guess. 30,000? 30, 30 people? 5%? 10 percent? 10 percent. 100,000. 100,000 will be people with dementia. <laughs> so how many caregivers do we need to cope with? Right? Do we need volunteer to support this caregiver? Right? Who knows caregiver best? Caregiver knows caregiver best. <laughs> so how do we get them to volunteer and build that whole support group? before we move into a whole aging population. So that's the end of, and I leave you with this thought, all right? And uh, I want to share one quote with uh, from Gandhi, is that uh, we find ourselves when we lose ourselves serving other people. Actually, this was shared with me by a volunteer during when I was uh, managing a, a dormitory operation uh, during our COVID uh, circuit breaker time. Somehow we forgot already because COVID passed very fast. <laughs> We converted the sports center to become a dormitory, and uh, I, we get more a lot of uh, freelance sports um, uh, coaches who lost their job to volunteer, and, and we paid them. And after, at the end of the sharing, one of the men shared with me this quote, and I think it means a lot. Yeah, we found ourselves when we lose ourselves serving other people. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for being here and staying throughout from morning. I know it must have been so tiring for you, but I'm so happy that you're here. <laughs> How many of you know what PPIS is? Singapore Muslim Women Association. Are familiar with the work? No? Uh, okay. It's all right. So PPIS is a Singapore Muslim Women Association, and uh, it was set up in 1952, and it was volunteer-driven. At that time, there were 22 women who actually fought for the rights of uh, women, uh, Muslim women and their children. It was a period whereby there were rampant divorces, where men were just divorcing the, 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 the women, and women were uneducated, unemployed, so they were left in the lurch. So there wasn't any organization at that point in time to assist them. So these 22 women, if you look at them, in all their ancient baju kurung and all that, they were there to, to, uh, 
to set together some kind of uh, programs for the women. It could be a cooking class or a sewing class. The men were not very happy about it. They said, why are you taking my women away? But this is one way of them empowering. At a very I mean, at a time when 1952, nobody thought about women empowering at that point in time. Yeah. So fast forward to 71 years later, this year we, are, we have all together 17 centres throughout the island. So we have SIM Academy, that's a family therapy institute. Then we have two family service centres, uh, one in the east and the west. And then we have four specialised service centres. These are service centres that caters to minor marriages, those who are marrying below 21. Then we have remarriages, those who are marrying for the second time. So they go to the centre for some uh, marriage enrichment. We also have a divorce support, support specialist agencies and the fostering agencies. And on top of that, we have the seven preschool centres and student care. And then the latest addition is our Rise Above Halfway House that caters to 30 women ex-offenders who are being trained to get jobs and to be rehabilitated and to reintegrate it into the family yeah, into, and the community. Yeah. So how do we go about institutionalizing our volunteer management practice? I mean, it was a period where, I mean, uh, like uh, this happened two years ago, actually. All this time, we, like Melissa was sharing, uh, Google, Google spreadsheet, we use Excel spreadsheet. So every time we have a new volunteer, we just insert the, the name in. So that was the kind of database that we had. Very raw, very manual. Yeah, but uh, thank goodness for some NCSS funding that we got. So we managed to hire a volunteer manager to look into the... Uh, you know, to develop the capabilities and capacity. Yeah. So we wanted also to improve the professionalism of the volunteer management. Uh, like I said, now we are on CRM system. We have a volunteer management system on CRM Salesforce. So uh, we can track volunteers. We can uh, link, I mean, mesh volunteers to the kind of uh, roles that is required. Yeah. So how did our journey begin? I mean, it was like uh, I mentioned earlier, in 2021, during COVID time, when there was all this funding, so we took advantage of that. Initially, it was like, okay, uh, the volunteer manager is someone who, we didn't have a dedicated one. It was someone who's doing other work, but double-hatting with the volunteer management role. So we can see that her, her, her focus will not be so much on the volunteer management, yeah. So, and uh, when we had the volunteer manager, that's when we started doing the volunteer engagement framework. Uh, and then we went through all the works of training, you know, yeah. Of course, uh, getting buy-in from staff can be quite a challenge. I don't know how it is in your organisation. But um, initially, it was like the centres, all our 70 centres, are they're, they're working in silos. And so they say, oh, we have our own set of volunteers. And it's through friends. And all that. But what we wanted to centralise them so that we know who they are and we're able to provide some kind of, uh, I mean, retention and appreciation, you know, things like that, yeah. So um, what we had to do was to have the leadership to engage the staff on the ground to say that why we need to build this volunteer culture within the organisation because it is so important that some of the work that can be carried out by the volunteers and then we can leave staff to do the high order work, yeah. So that was the main, you know, yeah. Of course, we wanted to know that uh, some of our staff are also volunteers, so it's in appreciation of them too, yeah. And... Uh, so we ensure that there are regular roles to foster strong culture of altruism. In the past, there wasn't any, so volunteers don't feel a sense of loyalty to the organisation as and when they have ad hoc. And then when COVID came, it was also a challenge. There were not much volunteering uh, opportunities. So that's when we can we tend to lose out some volunteers, yeah? And uh, so we redesigned some of the volunteer roles to alleviate staff workload. And uh, I mentioned we have 17 centres. So what we did was we centralised all the volunteer management into uh, at our head office. But in all the centres, we have volunteer co coordinators. These are the admin staff. So they also double head as the volunteer co coordinators, meaning in terms of recruitment, in terms of what they need. So they work with our head office on this. And uh, over the last uh, one year, we actually had our volunteer continuity plan. So we can ensure that uh, volunteer partnership will continue during even during a crisis. And uh, with the CRM uh, system, the VMS, that we're able to track volunteers' contribution, and then we also identify and de develop leaders. So among them, and they could, they are the mentors to the new volunteers. So when we do onboarding, it is not just staff doing onboarding for the volunteers, but also together with the volunteers, because then they would have been able to give the first-hand info, you know, about what volunteerism like in PPIS. Yeah, and and we have regular networking events. We had one last year. Uh, and where they bond, share best practices, and exchange developments. So in, in May, this coming May, we're going to have a popcorn movie night for the volunteers. It's just one way of us uh, saying thank you to them. Yeah. So, uh, 
I move on to what staff volunteerism in PPI is all about. So while we require volunteers, but within our organization, there are staff who actually volunteer, and we acknowledge that. So what we've done this year would be, was to give a one-day volunteer leave for every staff to volunteer at our centers or at any other centers of their choice. So in that way, they, they feel that uh, it is, uh, they, are, they, are, they are being appreciated. And we're also working with uh, Singapore International Foundation for, them to, for us to actually send our staff to go overseas for some humanitarian. This is still work in progress. And last, last year, in December, we started our first PPIS Giving Week. That was when we get all our staff to go to Free Food for All to assist with their urban farming. And that really makes them feel very, uh, okay, something that's very different for them, knowing how to do uh, uh, farming, things like that. So for, for the staff, it's, some, it's, 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 it's an occasion whereby they appreciate the fact that uh, they are able to do this as a group together. So they bond. It's like a team building too, is yeah. And for staff also, we are doing tracking of volunteer hours, uh, not, not because we wanted to make sure that they focus on their work, they, do, they volunteer less or anything like that, but we want to make sure that when uh, their volunteer hours are, uh, are being taken care of, and then we are able to give some kind of a staff volunteer of the year kind of things. Yeah. So kind of that kind of award that we're looking at, yeah. So we also provide volunteering opportunities within PPIs because it's such a big organization. There's always opportunity for one staff. Just, just over the school holiday, we had our social worker going to the student care centers to help manage the kids because it's a one day. When, whenever it's a school holiday, the student care centers operate one day. So they needed extra help. Uh, and then we also inculcate the volunteerism at a very young age. Uh, we had our student care, they are, they are between the ages of 7 to 14 to actually read to our preschools. So during the March holiday, they went to the preschool, three of them, who are very good readers, to read to the little kids, you know, yeah. So that kind of thing makes them feel so important, say, and we, that's how we internalize volunteerism at a very young age within the organization, yeah. So, yeah, feel free to ask any questions later on. Yeah, very happy to answer, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Tumina. Yeah. So, uh, without further ado, maybe I just want to invite our three speakers, uh, if you all want to take your seats, yeah. Yeah, so that we can have an engagement time with our small audience here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I don't intend to take too long, so maybe I just want to quickly ask all of our three speakers, like if, I mean, before we go into that, maybe I should ask the audience first, how many of you here uh, from your respective organizations, you all have a dedicated VM, perhaps? Any dedicated? That means this person is solely a volunteer manager. How many of you here, your organizations have a VM, but it's double-heading with another function? Like maybe a social worker come volunteer manager or a program executive plus volunteer management or fundraising plus volunteer management. Okay, so this is a half hand, okay, <laughs> right. So, half, half, yes, okay, right. So, I think that's also quite the case for our previous uh, batch of audience. La. Yeah, so I think one of the questions which I wanted to ask, uh, wanted the speakers to share with the audience is that um, what uh, uh, um, you have heard from them, at some point in their organizations, uh, big or small, they have actually uh, uh, take a closer look at volunteerism. Yeah, and through that, they actually uh, did very drastic actions. Like uh, Hock Lin uh, uh, for AIC SGO, they did a lot of changes. He started to change mindsets. Uh, PPIS as well, they, they, they started out as a volunteer-driven uh, organization. And for BAPES especially, uh, they, they also have uh, volunteers manning their hotline. So what, what prompted them to really take a serious look at uh, volunteers? Yeah, so... Okay, so, so for, for BIPs, because as you guys have seen, uh, our team is really lean. So two years back, we actually only have seven staff. And with COVID, there was a lot of things that we needed to change, like innovation and work, work was just different. So we also needed to move to digitalization. So with all these new stuff, as we were trying to um, get things going for our service delivery, we also needed to um, get, get in more manpower. But I think it was difficult to hire then as well. But of course, we also had our volunteers. But because it was COVID, it was quite quite crazy for everybody. So from there, we realized that um, it was also opportunity that there was funding from uh, NCSS and there was SG United. So just now I shared on the internship. So that was actually a, a window of opportunity that, that created that role to become to where we are today. So if not for COVID, we will not have explored 
having a new headcount or a new role. And without that new role, we would not have been able to re-engage volunteers because during COVID, it was also a turning point for volunteers. There were people who were either being able to contribute more or they disappeared totally. So we kind of started re-engaging the volunteers from there. So from there, it was, we kind of started the whole new framework, re-evaluating our entire volunteer maturity yeah. matrix to see where we are. Yeah, so I would say COVID was that turning point. Thank you. So um, for Silver Generation Office, is a little bit different uh, from uh, most of the organisation here because it's a national agency. So definitely at the HQ, we have a few, uh, uh, four or five doing that, but it's 3,000 type of volunteers, right? But at the Satellite Office, we have 17 office. We don't have delegated uh, volunteer management, maybe one person that is doing that but it's uh, integrated with the person. So I just want to share the broad idea is that there's management, there's leadership. So the uh, leaders on the ground, everyone manage or lead the volunteers. So that's one thing to think about. Uh, so every division leader, every leader, they lead and manage. Uh, my, uh, my colleague is here. Uh, so you ask him, uh, he will say the right thing. <laughs> okay. Then I think about how to unlock the challenges. I, I myself also uh, do sharing for non-profit organization. Uh, so volunteer management is a big stuff. Uh, Melissa and myself, we all the same program, right? So, uh, and I think it's really thinking of how to unlock those constraints. Uh, and, and how do we view volunteer uh, uh, as a resource, right? If it's really a key resource, right? Then you really critical. Then you really put, in, put your head and hard uh, to think about how to unlock those. Uh. The other one way is really from that volunteer perspective can be your volunteer management. All right. Uh, and when you go to a larger skills, actually the uh, complexity is a little bit different, which is what I'm uh, looking at now uh, because of the aging population that we are coping with. Uh. So for yours, I think it's really thinking of how to uh, build into your system. All right even partner with other uh, organizations to unlock those constraints. And third is really from the volunteer perspective, uh, coming in to build the capability. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Halloween. Ours was like, I mean, I, I shared earlier that we, I'm being very candid about it. If not for the NCSS uh, funding, we will not be able to get a volunteer manager. Because there's always like uh, priorities, you know. Yeah, if if someone can do the work of volunteer managers and then do other things, why not? You see, but when the funding came out, I, I fought hard for it, and and we managed to get it, and that's when we had our volunteer manager, and it came at a very right time because it's during COVID, and when we need to actually look into all our systems, look into how we can change volunteerism in a way more skill-based rather than having event and carrying chairs here and that kind of thing. So it's no longer that nowadays. So and then with virtual, uh, you know, e uh, hybrid event and all that. So we had skill-based volunteers to actually mend the Zoom or help out with the, you know, with the staff on those kind of way. So it was really COVID and also the funding that we, uh, we actually got the man uh, volunteer manager here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to use this time to open up for a Q&A segment uh, yeah, with our speakers. So if anyone have any questions to ask our speakers, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Mike will go to you yeah, for you to ask our speakers. Any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Keeling. Any questions from the audience? No, no questions? You're very kind, so... <laughs> Right. Any questions from the audience? So let's say uh, you have a pool of volunteers and when, wherever you need them, you press the button to call. Um, I understand volunteer is like if they, are on an, if they want and if uh, you require, they can make it, they will do it. Um, but let's say, because I'm also from MOH, if let's say we need a, a volunteer force that, you know, in a crisis button or in a uh, 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 crisis uh, time, peace time, not, not peace time, but crisis time that we need to press a button to get these volunteers. Mm. Um, what are the uh, direction or practice that you all do to get volunteers on board? Uh, rather more, more than just, uh, you know, your passion and all these, but uh, maybe from my, my job point of view, uh, it's more of operations and how these volunteers can come into operations 
uh, when we need them. Uh. Yeah. Maybe Melissa, you have the 24-hour hotline manned by volunteers. Yeah. So, I mean, our hotline, we, we kind of face uh, an issue sometimes during like uh, festive season, like Christmas, New Year Eve, we might face uh, a down, down time. So how we, we communicate with our volunteers is we have a chat group. So different functions, for example, the helpliners, there'll be a chat group, the, the casework and the, the usual one is with everybody in. So for example, specifically for helpline, what we do is we will just do a blast out. And because we currently have the job role redesigned, we identify uh, assistant team lead and team lead. They would be able to kind of step up in a way. So by identifying those who are able to take on larger responsibilities and kind of know the ins and outs, they are able to kind of step in during uh, times of need. And of course, staff will also be the buffer. Should there really be no helpliners, then the, the staff will have to mend. But in the last, last year, not, not many. In the first year we were trying out, staff were mending during the whole festive period. Lah. But because we understand as we are trying to build. But over time, if we have that stable pool, it should be able to work out. And the mode of comms should be important because sometimes from a work level, we like to email because it's not so fast. But we also recognize that most people now text. So we also have to change with times on how do we reach out to them and get that response. Thanks. Maybe I, I answer the question in two perspectives. Uh, one is that you raise the volunteer force to prepare for crisis. All right, so that's one. Uh, then second one, during crisis, how do you uh, raise volunteer, extra volunteer? Uh, so using COVID. So I, I share my experience in, uh, because uh, when during the circuit breaker, right, uh, our migrant workers were the most affected. And uh, actually, I uh, was activated uh, from Active AG to uh, convert sports centre to become a dormitory. All right? uh, but before that, um, we also need to issue masks. I uh, remember those days, uh, actually, but past, like, uh, if you don't think about it, you can forget very quickly. And uh, uh, number one is to issue masks. Actually, that was my first uh, speech. Uh, as a chief active AG, not talk about sports, but mass. <laughs> and uh, incidentally, we, who do we activate? We activate uh, Team Nila. We have the, the data bank. La. And then uh, uh, 800 person responded within uh, 24 hours. And on the Saturday, we issued, uh, the Team Nila went to issue mass. And uh, interesting, after the issue of mass, uh, uh, we checked the records. Uh, a lot of them were non-active uh, volunteers. Then I think, how come? Uh, normal day, they never come. Crisis, they come. Oh, then I start to realise, actually, it's the meaning and purpose. Oh, because there's a cost to it. Then that's why it gave me some of the PowerPoint I share. It's really how do we articulate this meaning and purpose in uh, peace as well as in crisis. Right? In crisis, it's very clear. Right? But however, during crisis, there are also people that will step back la, instead of step forward. You can't blame them, uh, and I don't make a judgment because there are uh, people with young kids or a senior, so that should never be the way. La. Then from uh, my dormitory operation uh, perspective, uh, uh, those are very lonely days, uh, uh, but it's quite good because you go to all the markets, uh, all the good food, uh, no queue. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but you cannot eat on the spot. So I eat a lot of good stuff, right? So that is the most funny thing, right? Last time when Gramity, the Roja, you had to queue and you sell, right? But uh, don't need really because of our Gramity Sports Centre. But then you had to eat in the car and things like that. But uh, my, my answer is not about that. Lah. The, the answer is about, uh, actually, because we want to bring the micro worker to the community space called uh, Sports Centre, and uh, we don't want to alarm the people in the community. Worse, spread the fire back in the community, right? Uh, and then how do we do it? Of course, we do all the security, safety, and all those. Uh, and a lot of time uh, in consultation with our advice. Just now, there's an MP here. Just now, Dawn, uh, who speaks, is an MP, by the way. Uh, all right, uh, there was an MP here. And then uh, I, I talked to the MP, and then not the ministry police, but the uh, uh, grassroots, the, the, the member of parliament. Then we go around, make sure. And I told them that we need the community to be involved. Because we want to make sure they also support. And from this change in the mindset, actually quite interesting things happen. Who cut the hair of the migrant worker? No barber, ma. volunteer group come in. <laughs> and many organizations pour their resources into the migrant worker. And then that's how we build the... So during crisis, uh, those are incidental volunteer. You can also find a narrative to do that. But uh, you cannot just fight the fire. 
you must think about the influence part beyond the fire. Uh, so then that's how you rally people and so you build the goodwill and make sure that it's controlled. Because the other challenge will be that uh, it's COVID itself, but COVID is not the biggest thing, it's the fear itself. All right, fear is the worst fire. So that's how we build up confidence and then bring volunteerism in. Uh. And my final point on the question is that you cannot build an army uh, during the crisis. Uh. Your army must be built into peacetime. Oh, I've got, I'm an army, uh, last time ex-army. <laughs> we train 1,000 day, just use for one day. And hopefully the one day never come. Uh, yang jun qian ri yong zai yi zao. Oh, sound oh, then solid. Uh, sun zi. <laughs> oh, I only know these four sentences. <laughs> And during the peacetime, you have to rally and find meaning and purpose. Then during crisis, you can rally that. And I think COVID taught us that, bring our country closer because there's one common enemy, right? But if every day we not look at it as enemy, but it's a common cause, will we rally our, so our country, our society even better and bring out the compassion and empathy? Would this place be the, uh, the best place to live and also to age? Thank you. Ah, uh, can, can. Okay. Hey, you sit here, la. you sit here. Come, come, come. No, no, no. I'm just joking, joking, joking. Joking, joking, joking. Yeah, my boss. Okay, just to, to answer the MOH question about actually during the crisis, COVID 19, just to add in, uh, in fact, MOH activate a number of organizations in Singapore. Uh, AIC is one of us, one of them, to, to man the so-called the HRP hotline, remember the Protocol 2 hotline. So, so that data requirement, I think, because it's quite stringent, that's why I only activate the staff, AIC staff, uh, and in fact, the Con HQ, and all the way to the civil from my side office also. So other organizations, also SAF also involved, and uh, I think one more, I think, also, quite a number. So because that data requirement is very, very stringent, call, manning the hotline, you know, those people calling are very anxiety and a lot of questions. Some are, are not friendly, you know, over the phone, you know, scroll you, you know, the, 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 the so-called so uh, uh, isolation facility, they want hotel, they don't want to go to the dormitory, this sort of thing. So it's, it's quite an experience I really learned from there, even only two months. Uh. Two months uh, is good enough to, for me to learn a lot of things. I mean, those uh, skills and the knowledge uh, to handle this sort of call. Just to add for this part. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's okay, don't worry. Yeah, thank you. We never had real crisis, but there was one, I think, related to DOMS also. We have a childcare centre. It's one of flagship childcare centres at Bukit Bato, on top of a hill, very beautiful place. And next to it is an old school. So when we heard that they are going to place some of the migrant workers there, you know, uh, I think the, the, the centre got very like, okay, now how do we come to the, to the parents who are sending the kids there, you know? So what I did was then, I, I told them, okay, let's make, let's provide hampers. Let's let the kids do a, a care card for the, for, the, uh, for the migrant workers. So in the end, the, the families came in in full force to create hampers for these migrant workers who were coming. And we actually went over to the dorm to present this and the care card from the children. So it's how you twist your, you know, your crisis situation to one that's a positive, that's opportunity for the kids to learn. And the cards that they wrote was that, oh, thank you for building our homes. So that was so heartwarming for us that all that we wanted was that just do a care card and just write whatever wishes that you want. But of course, the teachers initiate this. Like, okay, why don't you say something good about, you know, okay, they build our homes, they build our roads and all that. So those are things that we did. Lah. So there's always opportunity in crisis that we can turn, uh, you know, positively up. Very well said. And I think uh, uh, in every crisis, find opportunity. And... Uh, even our workforce right now is not really volunteer because I uh, was trying to also help the freelance uh, sports coaches. All of them have lost their job, Zumba instructors, but not no ladies, uh, all the guys. Uh. Uh, so what I did was actually employ 800 of them in the industry. And then they came forward and support. And I can do a rotation system. And I can tell you during those times, uh, it's really almost life and death. Uh. Why? Because there's no vaccination. And when we take care of the migrant worker, we wear full PPE, MOH have no time to teach us how to, 
how to wear PPE. I watch YouTube, <laughs> do own research, set up my own audit team. And you can think about the whole system that we have to do it to feed them, shelter them. And when you have COVID, uh, real COVID, uh, I have to wear PPE full to be the first person to handle the first COVID case. Because once the leader run away, don't need to talk about workforce, volunteer force, everybody run away. Uh, so leadership at the front. No? So I, I think COVID is the nearest crisis that we can see. And at the earliest day, is really the fear is the biggest thing, right? And uh, but the problem was that we are using a SARS mindset to deal with COVID. So the learning is really important. Uh. So to your point about the volunteer force, there have many reasons. And then after that, you have to build confidence for people to come forward. Then slowly, like you say, family come. And all this, the, you build a compassionate response to COVID situation. And if you uh, remember during that twist, the narrative was very negative on our country, how we treat micro worker. And the way that we frame it was operational sayang. Sayang take care of the migrant worker in the Singaporean way. Right? Uh, then I think you can twist that narrative to be something positive and you guide your action. Yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing back so much memories. <laughs> <laughs> I have cold sweat now. <laughs> Go and know PPE. <laughs> but I, I, I think it strengthened us. Like. Anyone else have a question? Hey, no questions straight away. Bring out the beer already. La. <laughs> hey, very good. Eh? You must give them a award. Eh? Stay until 5.30. Yeah. Hey, any questions? Uh, SUSS teacher? Uh, then uh, not teacher say something about your teacher. <laughs> no, la, joking. La. Any question? Uh, uh. Besides that, what else? Then probably is looking at job redesign. I mean, what? How how can we make make that space for an individual to be able to take on that role? Because we can't expect, for example, a social worker to take on full cases at the same time manage. So it has got to be split in that sense. Because most of the agencies, like even the one that I was at before, it was split. So you kind of need to prioritize. So at times, if let's say you really need to find volunteers, then you need to dedicate probably more time in the day to engage volunteers. So something's got to give. We can't expect to keep loading because we are also mindful of burnout in the sector. And the last two years, this has been really real. And we also have to, to know that you know, they are also managing what's at home. So with, especially for our, our nature of work, because it's quite intense. So I mean, the success is how do we um, redistribute the work and yeah, to include the rest in it. I have a few thinking. So number one is from demand and supply. La. So number one, uh, articulating the from the demand side, the meaning and purpose is absolutely important, right? Uh, even before the headcount. Because headcount is just the resources. So the narrative is very, very important. Why should I volunteer? All right, so that one might be clear. And from the demand part, uh, you have to also think about how to make it easy for other people to volunteer. So how to cut your work. All right, and uh, uh, clarity on the, the role and purpose, all right? And then accountability and things like that. Then on the supply side, you must understand where the volunteer come from. Lah. All right, then you try to unpack the supply. Who, uh, who can volunteer what role at which time, right? So if we understand then then the demand and supply can be better matched. Then after that, it's really integration already uh, from volunteer management perspective, as well as retention, re-energizing this whole volunteer. But the challenge is a lot of time, we only have one point of time, that kind of work, but no mastery, no progression. Over time, uh, it's also fatigue. <laughs> so that is the kind of thing I see. Is that, ah, every day do the same survey. Ah, right? Can we do other things else? How to grow that? And then grow leadership and things like that. Ah. So I see very successful volunteer management. Not, uh, I see one is from overseas country and the, uh, the organization I think about is Ziji. They have a very progressive way and anchor on very deep uh, uh, faith-based, uh, also regardless of faith, but the thinking process is really very robust. So I think we can learn a lot from that perspective. Yeah, thanks. Maybe just one more uh, input 
probably a compelling cause would really help to get volunteers into your organization. You have a very compelling cause and, uh, and the volunteers feel alt altruistic about it and say, well, yeah, so they, they would be there for you, like, you know? Yeah, thanks. So you got a very high end, but then after that, people leave, it's because of hygiene factor. Lah. That's why my uh, volunteer management have to make sure the hygiene factor are set up. So you have very compelling factors already, very good, you attract already. Then you need to think through all the, because all the friction, no? sometimes it's about uh, volunteer with volunteer, volunteer with staff, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So a uh, simple thing, got a lot of friction. No? Uh, it's, uh, it's not like all nice, uh, well oil. Eh? If it's well oil, no, don't need to op organize conference already. <laughs> oh. So I, I just want to say that uh, uh, don't just think on the, all the positive, but also the negative, how to make it less unpleasant and uh, make it as easy for people. Lah. And there's also an avenue for communication. Lah. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, good question. Good question. You can be a teacher lah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Lah? Hey, brother. Any you look very questions? familiar. Uh, uh. Yeah, on LinkedIn. Oh, <laughs> LinkedIn friend. Okay, okay, okay. See, Good time. media very important. Good time to reconnect. You from... Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Don't be too worried. Lah. Actually, a lot of us are dinosaur system. <laughs> we are slightly dinosaur minus only. <laughs> okay. But I think we are going to another D, lah, of course, digitalization and all this. Lah. But I think uh, uh, my view, uh, my view uh, is uh, don't always go for very high end. Lah. Because really, high end sometimes over catered. Lah. Uh, then it's not cost efficient. But, but I want to say from an AAC perspective, Active Aging Center, that's also what SGO is trying to do. Uh, to build volunteerism uh, for, to support active aging center. So uh, we had done the reframing is that because uh, Silver Generation Office only do the outreach and a lot of us are doing things like that, ma, right? One part. But actually one part not enough, uh, ma, outreach already, right? You still must bring them to one location if you engage, ma, right? Uh, so, but we then have to support you with the volunteerism, ma, right? Uh, so this, because we are strong so-called stronger in this area, so we try to build. But you can still also continue. So they open up more pipelines. Uh. That's something that we are trying to do. And then over time, we harmonize this volunteer. They can become both or they can do something. Then we, we actually, because you see, the uh, whole aging population affect our family, all of us individual and as a country. So we need to build a more integrated system. Uh. So be assured, don't worry. Oh, we, we are also helping at this level. But then uh, there are many levels to coordinate, lah, just to feedback this one. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you all so much for your time. I was told that uh, we have overran our time. Oh, hey, you got yeah. medal for them or not? Got, we got medal. Yeah, uh, yeah. Very good. Eh. Plus, aircon uh, off, they still see aircon here. Aircon, you still uh, <laughs> hey, must, uh, record down. Uh. Yeah, yeah. No <laughs> aircon. Uh. The power of volunteerism, <laughs> they still stay. Yeah.